Welcome to uh, Stegall's 2013. Um, we're delighted to have Mark Emberton as our visiting guest Stegall's professor. And what I'd like to do initially is just introduce you to where we are, the problems that we're facing at the moment, and whether focal therapy, which is a new and emerging uh, treatment option for prostate cancer, really is uh, ready for real-time use uh, in the urological community. So are we ready? So before I go on to that, let's first of all have a look what's happened since PSA was introduced. Uh, we know, for example, that radical prostatectomy was not a great success. We've looked at the WILT trial, the PLCO trial, and ERCT trial, and really, uh, although there has been some definite benefit for radical prostatectomy, it's been minimal. There's been over-treatment. We know that there are documented and well-documented side effects of whole gland therapy. We also know now that there are side effects even of active surveillance. In the two major trials, the PLCO trial and the European randomised trial, um, there was no benefit to screening on the PLCO trial. And yes, there was a benefit to screening on the European trial, but at quite a high cost. And in fact, there was a lot of over-treatment and minimal number of people lives saved, but the follow-up was a bit too short. What side effects do we have of radical prostatectomy? Well, we already know that there are well-documented side effects of urinary, sexual, and bowel. And these, in a trial which was reported by Rabani in European Urology, showed that in 4,592 patients, there was a 5 to 6% incidence of high-grade complications. So whole gland therapy is not without its side effects. What about active surveillance? We're all coming to the conclusion now that active surveillance is actually uh, a great way of avoiding treatment, but it's not without its own side effects. What about anxiety? What about infections after biopsies? There's some early evidence that erectile dysfunction may occur as a result of biopsies and active surveillance. Some treatments are more difficult after active surveillance. Uh, the selection of people for active surveillance is uncertain. The follow-up is uncertain, and there's been a remarkably low end uptake, certainly in the United States. Looking at erectile dysfunctioning after active surveillance, in a recent study, in the prior study, it was shown that 44 to 51% of 129 patients in this study uh, had erectile dysfunction at a 12 to 18 month follow-up. And that was reported in the British Journal of Urology. Another publication in 2009 by Fujita showed that there was a six point decrease in international index of erectile functioning on active surveillance. And this correlated with the number of biopsies. So whilst these reports are few, there's an inkling that we may be doing some harm even with active surveillance. When we looked at our own quality of life study, we noticed a definite drop in uh, erectile function and sexual function on people who are on active surveillance. And when we compared that with some of the other treatment modalities, such as brachytherapy and surgery, we were surprised by the fall of sexual function even on active surveillance. So active surveillance is not without its side effects. So that's why focal therapy has become a, um, a, a possible option. We know early stage prostate cancer should really have a treatment option that's curative, minimally or non-invasive, single session and with none of the side effects of radical treatment. We also should affect only the cancer with no damage to the adjacent vital structures. And it's a bit like male lumpectomy for breast cancer. Such a treatment has proven difficult in the prostate given its multifocal nature of the disease. There's been an inability to accurately locate the cancerous tissue and differentiate from normal healthy tissue. And there's also a question of which treatment option can be used um, to destroy the cancer but not destroy the adjacent tissues. Focal therapy 
The principle is to target the region of the prostate harbouring the malignant cancer only. And of course it's based on certain principles. Firstly, it's based on the index lesion concept, meaning that the index lesion or the main cancer in the prostate is the one that dictates the likelihood of secondaries and it's the one that's most likely to spread and therefore if you treat that then you don't have to treat all the microscopic other tumours. It also makes us or obliges us to continue monitoring these patients because obviously their prostate's still there so we call it active surveillance plus. We have to show that it's oncologically equal, we have to show that there's less side effects, it should have effective energy sources, it's only possible if you've got accurate imaging and it's only possible if you've got accurate biopsy techniques. Now of course prostate cancer is multifocal in 80% of case, uh, cases but in 90% only the the index lesion is biologically active. So therefore focal therapy may be appropriate. This paper by Hashim Ahmed in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2009 showed some original research in showing that the index lesion was the origin of many of the prostate cancer metastases, giving support to the idea of an index lesion. So focal therapy and MRI are emerging as a competitor therefore to active surveillance, but focal therapy requires close follow-up and serial biopsies and probably serial MRIs. So in summary it really is a form of active surveillance plus and this was described by Lorencheck and Klotz in uh, reviews in Nature Reviews in Urology. The follow-up of patients on act of uh, focal therapy is still poor. Uh, there are some early oncological data. Uh, there was a multi-institute study of low and intermediate risk patients with a 3.7 year follow-up where they did a match pair um, focal therapy versus radical prostatectomy showing a similar salvage therapy free survival by Barn in the European Urology. And there was also a 12-month follow-up by Emberton and his colleagues in, uh, in England in Lancet Oncology looking at a limited number of patients with focal HIFU. The 41 patients who uh, had a 12-month follow-up with the HIFU showed only 2% with grade 3 complications and um, it also showed a very high rate of elimination of the tumour from the region treated. There was also 106 patients who had focal therapy and it showed that there is a bit of a learning curve but again the complications of only 1.9% grade 3 complications uh, included no incontinence and although erectile function uh, did drop a little bit it was certainly less side effects than whole gland therapy and this was described by Barrett in European Urology uh, just this year. That then comes the idea of which energy source we're going to use. Is it going to be freezing, cryoablation, radiofrequency ablation, ultrasound or MR guided HIFU, um, image guided laser therapy, photodynamic therapy, brachytherapy or a nano knife? And obviously all these energy sources have been used and it will um, take some time to work out which is the most effective and maybe one doesn't fit all. So will the paradigm shift from whole gland therapy, therapy of radical prostatectomy, brachytherapy to focal therapy with one of these treatments? And I suppose in some ways it's analogous to the shift from radical mastectomy many years ago uh, to lumpectomy and radiation therapy for localised breast cancer. What's really underpinned this is improved imaging. We now, now know that a good multi parametric MRI is greater than 90% sensitive in detecting clinically significant prostate cancer when compared to radical prostatectomy specimens. And Arnaud Villiers uh, from France showed that back in 2006. And there's been a number of other publications from Puchadal and Lemaitre since that time. 
multiparametric MRI can accurately detect up to 80 to 95 percent of tumours and it can also differentiate between the high grade tumours and the low grade tumours and appropriately delineates tumour shape and therefore should be able to assist in guiding an ablative source to the tumour. This is just some um, examples of X-rays or MRIs which have been done in Jelle Berens's unit over in the Netherlands and again it shows quite clearly that the whole mount prostate shows correlation with the MRI and not only that but it shows correlation with the grade and here again the grade correlates very well with the intensity of abnormality on the MRI. The other thing that's helped focal therapy gain a foothold is better biopsy techniques. For example, transperineal grid-directed uh, biopsy is now showing 95% sensitivity in detecting clinically significant prostate cancer, and this was published by Ahmed in 2012. I think also transperineal biopsy has proven better than standard transrectal biopsy um, and in fact where transperineal biopsy has followed transrectal biopsy there's been a significant upstaging to bilateral disease and there's also been a significant upgrading uh, in almost 30% of patients. This is the technique of doing transperineal biopsy and I've now been involved in doing this, in fact pioneered it many, many years ago and uh, have now done over 7,000 of these cases and it's proven to be safer and more accurate. The problem with transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy is one, it tends to miss important cancers, two, it picks up insignificant cancers and three, it often under, undergrades them because it's not hitting the area in, uh, in question so it's not using uh, MR guidance. This is a typical example where there's a more anteriorly placed tumour and um, these ones are notoriously missed by the transrectal route and I think the transperineal route will avoid this. Increasingly we're all using um, MR guided biopsies and again this will make biopsies even more accurate and of course the more accurate biopsies and imaging becomes the more possible focal therapy will become. The technique I'm using is MR ultrasound fusion, but I know, uh, for example, uh, Les Thompson up in uh, Brisbane is using uh, gantry, in-gantry biopsies, which I was also using and still continue to use. Um, I think the danger with that, of course, is it's transrectal and therefore you're increasing the risk of infection, so I prefer this option. And this is uh, doing one of these cases. It shows here that you've got a, um, a, a small lesion which you can circle where you've overlaid the MR image with the ultrasound image. So there's much more accurate and more likely to target the higher grade lesion. This is more the MRI guided biopsy in gantry, again transrectal. And this is, a tech, this is inside the gantry and this is doing one of these cases. Uh, it's quite time consuming, uh, it's a little bit uncomfortable for the patient because it's not under an anaesthetic, uh, but uh, I must say it, it has been shown in experienced hands to be quite an accurate way of doing things. So on the other side of the coin of course, what's, what don't we know about focal therapy? Well, we don't know yet the oncological efficacy. We don't know the results long term or even short term. We don't know the extent of treatment that's needed. We don't know which energy source to use and how to deliver it. We're not sure about the patient selection and we're not sure about the follow-up. So certainly it's uh, only starting. This, for example, are the different definitions of focal therapy. Do you do uh, a little focal ablation on the right of your screen or do you t do a hemi ablation or a three quarters ablation. They're all called focal therapies and of course you'd have to individualize this and this needs to be still worked out. So it seems logical that if you can hit a tumor with MR ultrasound guided biopsy and you can get to the most aggressive part then obviously you can put a needle in and treat it. And so that's underlies and underpins focal therapy. And there's been many papers to show that uh, targeting the biopsy and targeting the lesion is possible, so it should be possible to treat it. This is an example of using the laser to uh, treat it 
direct, uh, and this has been done in Gantry. And the other thing that's been done in Gantry is um, HIFU. Again, another example of uh, focal therapy using the laser. And um, the beauty of this, of course, is that you can actually wa watch it real time inside the Gantry machine. So this is freezing. It gives you a, a, a hyper intense rim. Uh, the problem with freezing has been that there seems to be a bit of a learning curve. There's been a lot of technological improvements and um, it's not quite as exact in terms of the, ex the delivery of the energy. This is a technique that I've uh, been doing in addition to HIFU, focal HIFU and focal nano knife. Uh, the nano knife is uh, a fairly novel way of uh, using focal therapy. Uh, quite reliable in its destruction and it's already been tested in the liver and it's been tested in the pancreas. Um, it requires uh, several electrodes to be placed and electricity passed between those in a pulse fashion and that destroys the uh, cell membrane uh, leading to irreversible electroporation and death of the uh, tumour and uh, with remarkable reliability. And uh, of course this is very new and um, this we'll, we'll be reporting our results of this uh, jointly with uh, the English group and the American groups. This is for example a lesion before the nano knife in the anterior part of the prostate and here shows very clearly that that lesion has been ablated. Uh, and again um, we can keep going on about the different uh, types of treatment. Here is an example of an, uh, an MR laser therapy and uh, an MR ultrasound therapy. So in conclusion then and as an um, entree to the meeting uh, I'd like to say that there is now evidence that focal therapy may be an option in a select group of people. Uh, are we ready? I think yes we're ready. I think it's an emerging treatment but yes it's very early days and we need to be very careful about how we bring this in and I look forward to uh, the day's speeches and talks uh, here at the Steggles 2013 meeting and particularly Professor Mark Emberton. Thank you very much. <laughs>